Today, I'm interviewing Philip Cargon. Good morning. Philip. Good morning, Vic. How are you? In this, I'm, well, it I'm, looks quite sunny where you are. It's, it's a lovely sunny day. Actually, it's it's gorgeous. And as as the with as the weather gets worse, or you know, colder and wetter, uh, you know, you appreciate the sunny days more and more. Yes, you get it. You know, you do. In fact, you've. I'm I'm only the next county down from along from you but it's not as sunny here so there we go yeah it just goes to show you that you get more hours of sunshine in sussex you do you do apparently so my traditional first question mm. is what do you do um well i i write and speak and I try to use other parts of my body as well as my mouth and hand, as it were, um, or finger. I actually write. I've been writing for 30 something years with one finger. My wife says I ought to get it insured because if I ever lost it, I'd be in trouble. Um, right. So apart from using my one finger and uh, I try to use the rest of my body in the garden. We've got a lovely garden here. Right. And, um, yeah, that's that's what I do. Cool. Well, we're going to unravel all, all the intricacies of your creative etc life blah, mm. blah 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 all right and there there are quite a few threads to pull on i think actually so um what are your sort of main interests my main interest is really in psychology and spirituality and where they overlap i find when you put the two together that place where they meet is really fascinating mm. And um, I've tried to immerse myself fully in one or other side of that equation. And I've always found myself at some point longing for the other side of the equation. When I've got too involved in spiritual pursuits, I've tended to float up into the uh, stratosphere and have longed to come down to earth and to get a bit more real about stuff. And... Um, and 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 ditto with psychology if you if i stay just in the world of psychology it can be pretty dry i mean i don't know if you're familiar with sort of academic psychology and you know professional psychology it's pretty dry and uh and uh, but the two together is just fabulous you know yeah yeah i'm sure we're gonna because obviously I, i've um i've just sort of skirted around the out out side of of the sort of psychological thing just using techniques stealing things and try to find a home for them mm. within sort of music but um we'll we'll unravel some of that i'm sure as we go along so tell me what how did you start getting interested in this you know your life story then let's 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 sort of um go back to the early days of when you started to go oh the, the, that's the, interesting I, I know it's funny, isn't it? That that um, that dual interest, if you like, actually started when I was eleven. Everything seemed to happen when I was eleven. Uh, it was like um, I I read Lord of the Rings. I remember that. That's and, a good start. Uh, that's a good start. And uh, I met that I first met the friend of my father, who uh, was the old chief druid in London. He was running a college in London, and he was a family friend. And my dad actually worked for him. A, for a while as a tutor so so i i discovered uh this sort of nature spirituality of druidry and i read a book called the life of the buddha uh which was the book about the, the the story of the buddha gaining enlightenment and i was it immediately struck me that that was the only game worth playing the only yes. game in town worth playing was yeah. seeking enlightenment and at the same time i was asked to perform in Play. it's the only bit of acting i've done in a play school play where i was asked to um act as a psychoanalyst and i had to stick on a fake beard and i was even encouraged to smoke a pipe on stage which i found so nerve-wracking i'm uh, trying to light the thing and so on um, 
But uh, so so those themes, psychology, and my dad knew quite a few psychoanalysts who used to come around to the house and so on. Yeah. He had a lot of books on psychology around. So those two themes were there then, and they and they've just never stopped. That's been my interest all the way through. I th I, that's that's fascinating because it, it was strange actually because only recently if I I started to reflect about how themes like that start very early mm. and they stick with you. It's a bit like the sort of James Hillman sort of thing. The James you know, Hillman, exactly. Yeah, the acorn. Know, the, the sort of, yeah, the acorn. You know, the sea. Yeah. It's sort of you know, Plato sort of idea that you've you, you've got this. You know, within you there is. You, you know your essence of the whole sort of oak tree is there in the yeah. acorn and absolutely and, yeah yeah and um for me I, those things sort of came around yeah i would have said seven for me but really? it's interesting how you can pick a year in your life and go all those things are there you know this they're, they're sort of floating around and, exactly aren't they um my wife Stephanie um, is, a, is a scenic artist, so she was the scenic artist for Glyndebourne for you know twenty years. So painting these huge, vast you know sets, and when she was a little girl, her dad used to take uh, wallpaper liner, you know, that blank paper, and would run it, stick it up in the corridor. So this little kid, you know, seven, eight years old, was just painting, painting you know scenery right from that age. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. It's it's sort of very odd how um, you know events sort of uh, collaborate in order for you know you to fulfil that that urge. It's strange. It's very odd. It, it is, know. isn't it? And I suppose it doesn't apply to everybody. And you know, um, no, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know, because obviously we've got to story. talk to lots of people about it, wouldn't it, and see see whether they can do. Well, I, it I that's part of my <laughs> part of my nosiness. I, I like to see how many people have got these bizarre things going on that you sort of go, yeah, I, I recognise that. I recognize well, that. I think nosiness has is vastly underrated. So do I. As a as as a char characteristic, you know, uh, when people talk about. You know, people. Curiosity is is just so important. I think yeah. as as a character yeah. trait. You know. Yeah, I think so. So we've got then this great amalgam of Lord of the Rings, the story of the Buddha, you smoking a pipe on stage, pretending to be a psychoanalyst or whatever. It's fantastic mix. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> what what happens? at this point what, what starts what, what, to unfold what starts to unfold um well i remember at my school they the religious studies teacher found out that i was you know i suppose i must have told him i was studying the book and he asked me to give a talk about buddhism at the school maybe i was 12 then um and so i suppose i gave my first talk um then and um, my dad used to put on, he was a sort of impresario. He put on recitals and concerts. So we were having actors coming around all the time. So the whole, the whole sort of concept of, of performance and talking and, and putting on events was with me right, right from the early days. And from, from, the next sort of time that I can remember uh, clearly, as it were, is about the age of 15, 16, I got interested in photography and I developed had a darkroom. And um, the old chief druid invited me to uh, take photographs of the ceremonies that they were holding on Primrose Hill. Um, no, not Primrose Hill, um, Parliament Hill in London. And um, I would take the photographs and then I'd go to his house with the contact sheets and he would look through them and choose you know the enlargements that he wanted and so on and that turned out to be a sort of an excuse really for 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 us to talk about spiritual things and i asked him i became more and more interested in druidry he asked me to invited me to help out in some of the ceremonies that they did and um i i found myself as a, a teenager then in this strange sort of double world of um you know 
uh, all my friends, everybody smoking pot and sort of uh, lying around listening to music uh, on the one hand, but then me putting on a robe and doing a ceremony and, you know, and trying to marry those two worlds. And of course, they didn't marry because if I managed p to persuade one of my friends to come to a ceremony, they thought it was bonkers, you know, standing, standing perhaps in the drizzle, you know, on Parliament Hill wearing a white robe. Um, what age are you at this point? What age was I? 16, 17? And then I asked to be, and then I became, I wanted to be initiated as a Druid. Um, because it it was at that time, you know, the whole sort of flower power era mm. of uh, all the gurus coming over. And um, yeah. and then John Michel produced this book, A View Over Atlantis, which presented, you know, the landscape of Britain as magical, too. Mm. And then I had this old chap, the old chief druid, telling me about, you know, stone circles and ley lines. And, mm -hmm. and I discovered that my grandfather was a friend of... Alfred Watkins, who developed the concept of ley lines, and they ran a club together called the Old right. Straight Track Club, and so on. Right. So, so this idea of sort of uh, Britain as as magical was um, was very powerful for me. Not least because I experienced a lot of it as very dreary. We lived in Notting Hill Gate before it was trendy. Yeah. Uh, I used to take a bus up to Swiss Cottage to go to school and it would, you know, wind through Ladbroke Grove and all the rest of it. And it always seemed to be grey and raining. And, you know, school I found incredibly boring. And, and, um, and, and you know, in those days, you know, late 60s, um, there were still bomb sites. We, we, we yes. forget, you know, yes. bomb sites around. And, 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 and so I found, I actually found a lot of my life was kind of, gray and mundane in that way so the idea of a sort of a magical world was very exciting and then of course flower power came and you know and and it, and it did turn the color on didn't it i mean the, you know people say that and it's sort of true suddenly it became colorful and um that was the risk of course that you thought by getting stoned that you would um you, you could be in the technicolor world yeah. and then uh you'd enter the straight boring world and then you'd have to go and smoke some pot to get up into the colored world yeah. um and i was interested in you know how you can do this without having to do that mm. that's very interesting um one of the one of the little themes i i find fascinating personally when i interview people mm. is how i go oh my goodness this is something i've experienced myself in but on like a parallel Thing. Now, I don't normally talk about this with mm. other people, but my mother had trained as a medium. Ah. So I, I grew up in Cornwall. I was yeah. born in, in Kent, but we moved down there before I could walk. And um, so living in a house with somebody who was that psychic mm. was interesting as a child because, you know, I never got that sort of that was never shut down and living in Cornwall was quite interesting because it was quite it's a magical I, spot, I, it? it is a magical place absolutely um and uh, in reflection you know when I was talking to my friends they would often talk about things that now looking back you go there was a lot of stuff going on in the background of people that were open to whatever you know another another space you know let's mm. call it a, you know a liminal space that's yeah. a horrible word but you know what i mean it's that yeah. that bit in between um and um and and uh, but it didn't seem peculiar because it seemed normal to me mm. and it took me a long time to realize how different everybody else's life was particularly when we moved back up to um to sort of kent again um, mm. and uh, and it's only sort of in reflection that I, I sort of sort of got that and um so I've, i found that interesting that you having that connection with you know the, the chief druid um and that becoming and obviously that was interfaced with the 60s and and suddenly that became very cool mm. if you see what i mean um particularly as we you know, the 60s and obviously the 70s were pretty grim anyway, weren't they? Mm. When we got back out of the thing. Life was, as you say, not quite as, um, not very colourful, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, so any of that was interesting. So, yeah, I found that that was, that's an uh, an interesting point, what you're saying, that you, that 
when you're sort of almost like walking in two worlds. You know? well, well, that's right. I think, you know, the, one can have all sorts of experiences of which in the extreme is makes you conflicted when you're living in two, two very different worlds. You know, I, I, uh, when I was young, I, I, I started a travel company and uh and it became very successful and i found myself in two different worlds then there was the the mystic in me and then there was the the the, the, the sort of commercial person the person who was making lots of money and being very successful and i couldn't marry them and it's a very uncomfortable place and it's it's but those the, but they're very fertile places if you can sort of stick with it and learn from it so earlier on you know when i was a kid that sort of funny place of having my um my hippie friends as it were my friendship circle being in one world and then me stepping into this circle of older people because all these people and you know it's like you were talking about medium you know medium psychics yes. people who are yes. the members of the theosophical society oh, and they yes. all they all seem to be absolutely ancient i mean they were probably yes. younger than i am now you know what i mean yeah, no, but, totally, no, totally but, agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but older people appeared older when you're in those days you know um yeah. and and um and 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 most of my friends couldn't cross that. You know, they just thought I was stupid and wasting my time. Really. Yeah, that's a fascinating thing because yeah, you you are absolutely right about the you know the certainly the Christian spiritualist movement was, mm. you know, uh, there was a time. What was, I don't know how you you had a lot of the 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 older members who were the backbone of it, mm. and then you got the old character like me that would pop up every now and again and it was a bit like okay this is interesting yeah. um, and, uh, and then sort of disappear out again sort of thing that, that, that's right young people i've found in these lots of young people would come in and then bounce out pretty quickly because there was too big a gap in age yeah. and culture i think yeah yeah that's that's a, that's interesting now i i want to pick up that thread about your travel company because yeah. i, I didn't know about this do you think that that was sort of inspired by that sort of hippie idea of you know wanting to travel and find yourself type of thing in a strange sort of way well well what the the way it happened was actually um that um i i you know got got a holiday job in a travel company when i was 18 between you know university and well a summer holiday job actually and then and then i in my a level gap you know and um uh, but I went at, at some point, it was at the time of, do you remember what was it called? The three day week or the, yeah, 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 something yeah. like that when yeah. the miners were on strike yeah. and all the, I don't know. I just remember working with oil lamps. Yeah, the exactly. Office. There was no lot. Yeah. No electricity yeah. for what, great chunks of the day. What, what happened was that the two owners of the company decided to take each other to court and they had injunctions issued against each other, which oh, meant so. bizarrely, I was in charge of the office. When, and it was like a sort of a French farce. One of them would run in and say, has John been here? So I'd just sort of say, you know, my lips are sealed, you know. And, and then they'd rummage around and grab a few files out of a filing cabinet and rush out. And then 10 minutes later, the other director would come in and say, has Peter been here? Uh, you know, and grab some more files and run out. Um, so so I, I learned how to run a travel company very quickly. <laughs> So it sound, uh, sounds like British management of the 1970s anyway, doesn't it? If you sort of... <laughs> it's really, really odd. We, you know, we would have times where we would be ca counting, it was before the days of computers, where we would have a printed chart of an aircraft. And the aircraft, you know, charter flight would be due to set off to New York in a few hours. And somebody would run in and say, I think we've got too many people. And there would be two of us counting the seats on the plane. That had been ticked off and somebody said okay i make it 180 and the other person would say well i make it 179 so you start all over again desperately yeah. counting you know um yeah. so it was chaotic but but i learned a lot and i but i was still interested in you know my main interest was spirituality and so i came up with this i actually started a group called the esoteric society we we were living around the corner from caxton hall which is in victoria you know central london yeah and and i looked at all the books on my shelf and I thought, I wonder what would happen if I wrote to the authors, care of their publishers, and asked them to give a talk in Caxton Hall. Yeah. And, and to my amazement, um, they all replied. Every single one replied and said, sure. Amazing. And so I, I made a program of fortnightly lectures at Caxton Hall. And um, they, filled, they were full to overflowing. It That's was amazing. Overnight success. And so we started, you know, so they started this sort of club. It was called the Esoteric Society, and we had a magazine and all the rest of it. So I was 
by that time, I suppose I was about 19, 20, and, um, and I'd got married far too young. Uh, so I was married to a French lady, and um, we had a kid, boy, Matthew, and, you know, so lots and lots was happening. Right. And, um, yeah. That's amazing, because I actually, I actually remember, I, I didn't go to any of those talks, but I certainly remember about the, the talks that were at Caxton Hall. That really... That ring a bell for you. Mind. Yeah, it does. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. yeah. Interesting. I, don't, I, I can't remember where I saw those things, but, you know, it, 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 that's fascinating. Yeah, I maybe, yeah. It. Yeah, it was just it just told me. and oh, and the connection with the travel was quite simply. Um, mm. I arranged a trip. We we ended up with two hundred and fifty members of the of you know we had a little annual subscription, and uh, I arranged a, a, a visit to Bulgaria, and did it through the company I was working for, and yeah. um, the guy, the director of the company, wasn't uh, in the slightest bit interested in it. When I did the costing on it, I thought, gosh, I've made my annual salary with this one group um you know and uh i could have done that on my own i could have organized it myself and made my annual salary freeing me up for the rest of the year to do something else so i left the firm and uh and started my own company to do these spiritual tours but Amazing. as it happened the 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 sort of bread and butter of selling air tickets mm. took off and and uh, it just became incredibly busy, and um, and and the next fourteen years I spent trying to get out of the thing that I'd created. Um, mm. You know, that's incredible. That's an amazing story. Amazing. So, so what what age are you now? Sorry, this not, well, not now. Well, I mean, in the age well, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was sort of uh, I suppose about twenty to thirty four to my mid thirties. I think it was 30, 32, 33. I managed to sell the company to a multinational, which was great. Um, it became almost intolerable. I remember it reached a peak when um, the, I had an office in um, Covent Garden, and there were about a dozen people working. So we had a row of desks. It was a fantastically hot day. And a, a tramp came into the office and started ranting and throwing stuff around and at the same time it was so hot all the we had these big singapore airlines pictures sort of mounted on boards in the office they all fell down and at the same time i had had a member of staff embezzle a whole lot of money and take cash from customers and then not make their reservations so i had a whole family from india in the office who were supposed to travel all around germany and the member of staff had basically stolen their cash amazing and and it all peaked on that one day and it it was it was the sort of straw that broke the camel's back he said i cannot go on doing this that is you know if you're looking at this from like an archetypal point of view you think you know the fall has come into the yeah, <laughs> not not the house of cards down. It's totally bizarre, isn't it? It, it? it is bizarre. It's I'm not at all an angry person or an impulsive person, but I remember on that day, I was so angry with this chap who'd stolen the money. I walked out of the office. I grabbed a taxi. I took the taxi round to his flat. I rang on the door. His flatmate answered, and I said, "Where's John?" And he said, I don't know. And I walked past him and went through every room in the flat looking for him mm. uh, without asking for permission, as it were. Mm. And then and he said, I think he's in Chelsea Library. So I took a cab to Chelsea Library and I must have looked deluded, insane. You know, I walked through Chelsea Library, you know, looking for him because I just wanted to pick him up and grab him. Um, and then he went on a spree around London, staying in the most expensive hotels on our account. And so these these fact of these telexes in the days of telexes were coming in saying, Mr. You know, whatever his name was, has just checked out. His bill is five hundred and eighty pounds. Uh, he, he's assured us you'll be paying for it or something. Like that. It would never happen nowadays. But, you know, no. 40 years ago, they. Well, that's did. sort of an insane thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> to think that you're going to get away with that. I mean, what's. Well, he made the classic criminal's mistake, um, deliberate, you know, the unconscious at work. He decided to check into a hotel next to a police station. Yeah. And um, when, when and the receptionist rang up 
and I said, look, um, get the police round because he's, you know, and he was arrested. Um, so that's how it ended. That's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> totally bizarre. It's like those things when you hear stories of people that have broken into a house. Yes. Days where, you know, some somebody's expensive camera was there and they, they photograph themselves and then accidentally leave the camera behind. <laughs> you know, you sort of think, well, if that's not somebody wanting to be caught. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in in the company I worked with before, the other travel company, somebody blew the safe one night and they wrote a, a thank you note, which they pinned to the uh, safe. So I, I think they were able to match the handwriting of the suspects or something like that. But they put, put a little thank you note, which I thought was quite sweet in a way. It is really, but it's so bizarre. <laughs> you know, that's, that's weird. <laughs> so um, this is, we've got to this point. Uh, where, well, what's been going on with your sort of, let's call it your inner journey? The inner journey, I, what I did was in that period to 34, I, um, I decided to focus on my real, I, my Druid teacher died. I joined the Order of Bards of Syndrome. My Druid teacher died. I followed a Bulgarian guru, a guy called Omran Mikhail Ivanov who was a very charismatic chap who had an ashram in the south of France. I spoke French. We started his publishing company for the group he had. We used to go to the ashram a lot. Um, um, and he asked me to give talks in London for him. And he said, don't worry, you know, just just be open and, and you know, uh, it, it will come. So I used to give these sort of, I suppose you'd call them nowadays, channel talks. I yep. used to, in Kensington Library, and I would just tune in to him and then I would just, you know go you know so it was a very interesting period um and then after seven years um i sort of suddenly saw his feet of clay he he became i think he became deluded in the end yeah um he he you know i was really really fond of him but the whole guru thing is a very interesting phenomenon yeah. because basically you have thousands of people in love with one person yeah and and so everybody's trying to be very spiritual and nice to each other, but there, there's all sorts of unconscious backstabbing going on because yeah. they want to, everybody wants to be the guru's favourite, you know. Yeah. So there's yeah. all that weird stuff going on. And so, sorry, what because I was going to pick, I was going to say to you why why Bulgaria when you were talking about this this trip. Ah, so, well, well, <laughs> a, a strange. This is what I love about when you get into these sort of topics is you've got the other world the idea yeah. this other world that's where so what was happening is when i when i started the travel company uh at the same time my wife and i started this um or just before starting the trip we started the esoteric society talks in caxton hall we found a little booklet um about this group in watkins bookshop and we contacted them it was in french and we were invited there and we went and met the guru and fell in love with him. He was just so charismatic and radiant and lovely and all clever and funny and insightful. And, all and so we started kind of following his work. And it was a kind of unusual, I suppose you'd call it a sort of esoteric Christianity, although there wasn't much Christianity in it, really. Yeah, that's what um, I was wondering. That's yes, what I was wondering. Yes, it was, um, you know, it was supposed to be originating in the sort of Bogomil movement in in uh, which was connected with the Cathars and so on. Right. Anyway, um, he he uh, uh, and so so that was going on. And for seven years, so say from 20 to 27 or something like that, I uh, we followed that. And when it went wrong and he started to become very self-obsessed and the movement grew and grew and grew, um, I just wanted and this was where I, I turned back to psychology I thought I want I want some grounding here so I started a, a science degree in psychology so I started going to UCL so I had a travel company at that time a little boy um, a very very difficult marriage um, and but sort of vast amounts of money pouring in so we didn't know what to do with it you know so it, yeah. was, it was sort of crazy really yeah. and um, so we had a beautiful house in Kew Gardens and uh, I started a BSc in psychology at UCL in London. Absolutely loved it. But of course, it was like hitting the ground at a thousand miles an hour because suddenly you were into scientific psychology, experimental psychology and so on. Yeah. And then and then I, I realized I needed to balance that up with something more interior. So I decided that what I really wanted to be a Jungian analyst. So I started a Jungian. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. 
I started a Jungian analysis. So, yeah. so, so I would move from, I'd go to the analyst four times a week and lie on the couch, couch and recount my dreams. Then I'd rush off to the office in Covent Garden to make sure that the sort of dozen people working there were sort of doing what they needed to do. And then I'd go to UCL and do the, I mean, God, no, I, when I look back, I don't know how I fitted it all in. Um, and then I would do the, the, the degree work um, and then get home to my young family at home. You know, um, that's what I was doing. That's extraordinary. I mean, I was going to say, because, you know, young as we all know now, was had one foot in one world and one foot in another. Um, you know, incredible. But, but what, managed what, to sort of pass it all off very scientifically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What wonderful yeah. stuff. And cool. and the combination of and then and then what I did is I had always intended to as the icing on the cake. What I really wanted to do was psychosynthesis which is a development of, you know, the first Freudian analyst in Italy, then became the first Jungian analyst in Italy. And then he developed his own form of psychology called psychosynthesis, which was a much more overtly spiritual sort of psychology. And I decided that I wanted to do that. And I was sort of going to do it after my analysis. But there's a there's a there's an idea they have in psychoanalysis is which is goes, you know, when your psychoanalysis analysis is over, when you realize it could go on forever. And I <laughs> I remember after about four years lying on the couch talking about my dream, I sort of, I just knew, you know, look, this, this can go on forever, you know, uh, and I switched to psychosynthesis and it was just fabulous. And uh, that triggered all sorts of changes, including my getting divorced and finishing that sort of chapter of my life, really. Yeah, this is fascinating stuff. Yeah, because, um, it, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm often interested in, the weirdness of when you write a piece of music that actually becomes your life. And and that sort of thing where something triggers changes in a pattern of, you know, and you can sort of go back and go, how did that result in all these changes? But there are certain key points, and it's not a logical thing. It's almost like there's a sort of, you know, like an acupuncture point, if you like. Uh, uh, that, that's so interesting. You mean, you mean when you've written a piece of music, it's sort of triggered some process of change in your life? Mm-hmm. How interesting. Yes, because, yeah. and often st songs that foretell, you know, events, and there's lots of these, you know, you can go uh, John yeah. Lennon. You know, uh, the only one I know is you know Moby, the one about flying. You know that was just before nine eleven, and and no, and, no there's lots of them. There's is lots it, of them. How interesting! That's really yeah, the uh, John Lennon's uh, song "Happiness Is a Warm Gun." Oh God! Yes. You know, and yes. uh, there's a, there's a song by Hendrix that sort of almost foretells how you know that he wasn't going to be around. You know, all this sort of thing, and you look yeah. at that, you go, well, and I mean the obvious example of this is. Um, is uh, Bowie actually? I mean, lots of songs by Bowie are sort of predictive in in, in reflection. You would not, you know, is it? I suppose it's a little bit like a sort of any any sort of predictive thing. It's only in reflection you go, oh yeah, that wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. But you look at it and go, there's a lot of weird stuff here, you know. But um, interesting, yeah, yeah. I, I and I think a lot of this is that. Maybe it goes back to this sort of thing that we were talking about earlier, when you look at your life and go, it's strange that you could have predicted where you were going because by the age of 11. You know, exactly. A, fr a friend of mine who's a novelist said to me the other day, she said, um, I have become the person I've always wanted to be. Yes. And 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 I suppose, you know, when I look back, you know, if I talk to my 11 year old self. Yeah. You know, he he would have said, you know, what do you want? And I'd said something like, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Exactly. I, I would have said, I want to be, you know, uh, a spiritual person who's seeking enlightenment, uh, who's also a psychologist, you know, yeah, and who writes. You know, I used to write short stories as well and stuff like that. Yeah. And who's a writer? You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's this is the type of thing I mean. It's almost like that that's going. Let's say it's just unconscious, right? Mm. Let's say the unconscious that makes that, you know 
makes those sort of things come to you, if you like. Mm. Maybe the same, I'm suggesting, I'm not saying this is because I don't, because as soon as you start dealing with this stuff, you know, I, I think logic is problem. Yes, we can never be sure. Yeah. Exactly. But maybe those processes are, are, are not that dissimilar from what happens when people create something. Mm. Uh, and then the storyline starts to to become what your life, you know, whatever it is. You know. But yeah. I, I am fascinated by this and it's part of, you know. And it's, and it, and it's fascinating uh, also in terms of working with other people, either, say, with clients and psychotherapy or coaching or just generally with friends or with your kids, you know, um, is is how can you nurture that and facilitate it you know yeah. if you can at all you know is there a way and i think there is a, i think there are ways to facilitate it to encourage it in people yes yes i yeah. think so. i think so definitely so um you obviously get to a quite a watershed um moment so is the is the is the sort of involvement of, of druidry still there or is it just floating around as is this is well, well, what what happened um, was one of those uh, utterly uncanny uh, events that changes your life, really. And it was just so strange. I mean, I, I if you can imagine, so I've got this travel company. We've got this big house in in Kew Gardens. Very difficult marriage. Um, very successful travel company. Uh, I've done these various trainings and all the rest of it. And I was at that time. One of the things that kept me sane is that I would meditate every morning before going to town and, and, and doing the degree and, and, and working in the office and having the analysis and all the rest of it. I would just sit and this form of meditation I would use would be um, just sitting. In other words, I would just sit with an empty mind, really, and just try to keep it empty and, and just settled and clear, you know, for a while, you know, probably not long, 10 minutes or something just before the, the hectic day began. And I was sitting there one day and I suddenly became aware of my old druid teacher who had died nine years previously and um, I really hadn't thought about him that much I mean life had been so busy and crazy I just hadn't you know and and he told me a bunch of stuff um, and you, you know and he said basically you know have a look at druidry again because it's not something archaic and anachronic it's actually very relevant to the world today and, you know, take everything I taught to you, put it in the form, you know, when I taught you, you had to actually physically come and visit me in order to learn. You should put it in the form of sort of distance learning so people can uh, work with it. And, you know, I'd like you to revive the order that I started back in the 1960s um, and um, get my books and so on. And get my book published. He was also very keen on having his book. He'd worked for the last few years of his life and it had never been published despite him mm -hmm. leaving a thousand pounds in his will for that um so he was sort of in the other world rather Amazing. cheesed off that he hadn't you know hadn't been fulfilled and um and and then that was this extraordinary from then my life changed in the most extraordinary way i mean you know his manuscript came you know came to me and it got a publisher met me and wanted to publish it and um we started the order again and uh i got divorced and started a new family and um, moved to Lewis in Sussex and found myself traveling all over the world. And the, the order became, the sort of distance learning program just became huge. We have 25,000 people have taken it so far and it's published that's, that's in amazing. six languages and we have sort of camps and gatherings all over the world. Just, you know, my life just changed totally. Completely. Yeah, that's, that's incredible, isn't it? Um, you know, when when I I love to hear stories like this because um, you know you can imagine obviously from my background I, I I've I've heard things like that where you sort of go it's just so weird you know how the you know and and you can't there's like you know people sort of talk talk about cause and effect but it's almost like well the effect is the cause and and you just can't get your head around which way it all fits together. Well well, what it what it does is it really highlights, I think, you know, my we, we, we went through a patch of a lot of friends dying. There was one year where seven friends died all in you know the space of about six weeks. And, and I remember my uh, youngest daughter, our youngest daughter saying, um, 
dad are you sure that we continue after death you know um and i and i said you know well of course none of us can know really uh, yeah. until it happens to us however all i can say is that somebody who had died nine years previously who i hadn't thought of that much because my life had been so busy suddenly appeared to me one day told me a whole bunch of stuff which uh then started to come true in the most extraordinary way yeah and and you know as an example that that was in that morning in the, that day i went to our office we had an office in long acre you know in covent garden mm -hmm. and in in the lunch hour i walked across the road to an antiquarian bookseller mm -hmm. and and I said, one of the things that the old Druid teacher had asked me to do was be, had been to find um, all of his books that had been published during his lifetime, because I didn't have them all with a typical sort of arrogance of a teenager. I hadn't I just waited for him to give me books every so often. I didn't go out and buy them. And um, so I went in and I said, would you happen to have any books published privately during the war um, by a man called Ross Nichols, you see? the forge press and he said well it's extremely unlikely he went downstairs he came up and he had a little package tied up in brown string and it was one of ross's books with letters from him to a friend and little sketches because he used to like sketching in his letters so there was a, a personal letter of his attached to this book and he said well surprisingly i seem to have this book here you know you can have it for 10 pounds Good God, that's and, just uh, incredible. You know, and that was just one of a whole string of extraordinary synchronicities that, occur yeah. that occurred. It's, it's strange because a lot of these things, you know, when you hear these stories, they often do um, involve some antiquarian bookstore. You know, I've heard the <laughs> story of somebody walking into it and a book literally fell off the shelf on them, which was what, the what, book, what, you know. <laughs> I, I know that, that there's a whole role in that. I've had over the last 30 uh, odd years of running the course I've probably had about five letters or emails from people saying I came across your work uh, when a book of yours fell on my head yes <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes yeah it happens yeah. I know it's it, it's remarkably bizarre there's, there's probably a, a sort of a species of sprite whose yes. training is you know they have to hang around in in yes. bookstores yeah flicking or, books or they just people. happen to be in your car when you turn the radio on and the song that you were talking about blah 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 you know comes, comes on. on the radio and that song shouldn't be on radio one you know what i mean yeah yeah absolutely yeah i know it's totally totally weird um <laughs> as a musician you might like this form of oracle that i've that i've i've discovered that if you, if i take my phone into the car um and I've got it, the setting, I haven't quite worked out what I've set, but it must be sort of <laughs> shuffle. Yeah. But it suddenly starts playing random tracks out of my collection. And, 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 and I've decided to use it as a kind of oracle to, you know, of course, sometimes, sometimes yeah. it's worth this incredibly apposite track that comes on. Yeah, well, um, I'm uh, talking about dead magical people. Yeah. Uh, William S. Burroughs. Right? Yeah. Um, of course, I, I, I do a lot of teaching techniques. I use Burroughs' cut-up technique. Oh, yeah. Which normally, yeah. just it's like, you know, just take this book and this magazine. But, of course, Burroughs was doing all sorts of stuff, like uh, flipping channels on TV um, and recording that on an open reel tape player and then obviously oh, wow. splicing the tape together. Because, I mean, he's not only was he the godfather of all that sort of stuff and friends with just about everybody in the music industry from um john lennon to to you know jagger and and bowie and and so on mm. um and of course he he lived an incredibly long life for somebody who was a drug addict yeah um and places like east grinstead and london and paris and goodness knows where else you know uh he's incredibly well connected and of course really sergeant pepper the the album is 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 sort of the Burroughs masterpiece that he didn't do because he's on the cover and the cover is really cut up, you know, all these. Exactly. Things. Alistair Crowley and various figures. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and of course, and, and Lennon used um, Burroughs's technique to do obviously sort of like I'm a walrus, but of course I, the, the classic one is a day in the life, which is three songs effectively, you know, a song by him and a song by 
McCartney sandwiched together with this piece of classical music that sort of happens. Mm. And, and he actually tells you how he writes the song by going, I read the news today. today. Yeah. yeah. So it literally yeah. just tells you how he did the song. Um, yeah. So, you know, Burroughs' thing of using, um, using music, you know, off the radio, spliced, you know, so he's also the godfather of sampling, you know, in a way. Yeah. You know, incredible um, effect. And, and, and I, you know, I use these sort of techniques anyway, as I say, beyond, you know, I do the first thing of that. But as soon as you get into the songwriting further, it's like, well, let's see how far down the road the rabbit hole we can go with. This. We can go with this. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that that what you're saying, you know, he, he was certainly using these things as an oracle. Mm, yeah. yeah let's yeah. do the oracle of the the news the news um reader today yeah you know, see what uh, or we'll use the oracle of what adverts there are you know what, what's yeah. this going to tell us incredible yeah yeah it, it's it's very interesting this because it, mm. again it def totally defeats the logic logical mind well that's right and i think once you've switched on to this so once you've taken on board that reality is far greater than you can you know that the, the the normal sequence of events the sort of pedestrian sequence of events in your life is only one narrative but actually there's some much bigger story going on that you can occasionally get glimpses of it's an incredibly liberating uh insight yes i think so yeah. that's yeah. i think that's the thing once you get over the sort of the weirdness factor, where your your brain just feels like it wants to sort of explode at this point, at this point. Um, and then you can just sort of laugh at it. Well, and it's redeeming, you know, because it means basically, however crap things seem to be, you just have to hang on to that one thing, just to remember that there's there's a bigger picture that's much more extraordinary than you can even begin to imagine. I think that's a very good point, actually. Yeah. Because like you know there is a i won't say there is a plan because i think the problem is we you know, we sort of go like you know whatever yeah. but i think you know our map of reality is so limited to what the reality is you know you know the ter the territory the map is not the territory yeah yeah it's almost like we need to put the the map down and just really listen to the forest yes you know, to get a sense of where we need to go you know yes yes so sorry i, I we were sort of wandered off the druidry path a little bit <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to pull on that thread a bit if we could so yeah. you 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 publish uh ross's book uh, ross's book and then yes so then then there's a period of 32 years from then so i'm in a in a new uh marriage uh we have two girls i've had two boys with my first uh, wife two girls with say so so uh, and living down in Sussex instead of at Kew Gardens. So the first period was in Kew, Notting Hill Gate and Kew Gardens. This is now Sussex. Uh, and over those 32 years, um, I train in psychotherapy, train Montessori education as well, start a little right. local Montessori school, f f initially for the staff of our office, uh, sending out the Druid um, course to people around the world. And... Um, so it you know over those 30 years and then and then i met a publisher at a dinner party who invited me to write a book and so so i've written a, a number of books about druidry and um and fast forward that so it's so, you know w basically a wonderful network of friends and contacts and people <clears throat> has grown up over the world no one particular type of person that's the other lovely thing mm -hmm. about it you know People drawn to a sort of nature spirituality seem to be all sorts of people, which is great. Um, lots of artistic, creative people, musicians, poets, artists, but also all sorts of other people as well. And um, and then about, you know, three or four years ago, I just started to feel that now was the time to hand on to somebody else. So um, we found a wonderful member who's Irish, a lady called Ema, Ema Burke, who just absolutely fitted the bill. Like me, she's a psychologist, psychotherapist, but also immersed in spirituality. She's got that lovely Irish kind of arm. Yeah. And uh, so so I handed, in June this year, I handed over to him. We were going to have a big party. We had 600 people from all over the world were coming to a big 
event in Glastonbury that was going to take four days. And we were having workshops and concerts and all that. All had to be cancelled because of the pandemic. And we had to do it virtually. So we did a virtual ceremony, um, complete with soundtrack. And um, I handed over in June. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? Sort of old meets new. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, strangely enough, I mean, as I think a lot of people are finding with the pandemic is, of course, it's awful in many ways. But there are some uh, silver linings in this cloud. Um, yes. So instead of 600 people um, flying all over the world with the eco footprint, we, you know, we were going to plant trees. We were going to plant, you know, 6000 trees to compensate and so on. Um, uh instead of that much you know more people were able to participate online you know um, yes is it yeah because <clears throat> you know i'm sort of on the fact that pandemics and plagues and goodness knows what they 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 are the real sort of catalysts of change in humanity you know you, if you look back you go look you can go oh, look after well, that it's like war, sadly, you know, just in the same way that one would never advocate a war, one would never advocate a plague. Uh, but but looking back over history, it seems they've triggered triggered great advice. I remember when I was doing the psychology degree, um, learning how brain science and um, and uh, particularly surgery yeah. has took an enormous leap forward in Northern Ireland yes. because of all the bomb injuries. Yes, you know, and yes. um, yeah. The well, the, the other the other one like that, of course, is plastic surgery in the Second World War. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, is it Chesham hospitals and stuff? Yeah, like yeah. That. You know, and obviously, I'm where I am at the moment. It's not far away from Pembury Hospital, which is where they used to do a lot of the plastic surgery. Oh, really? Work. Yeah, yeah. And that was dark in, you know, d As direct a result, result of, the of yeah, a lot of air, aircraft, you know, airmen being burnt. Um, sort of crushing, you know, not being killed, but being but just having awful injuries. Yeah, 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 yeah. E exactly. And, and you know, and I think, you know, so it's interesting. I was because I'm naturally optimistic, I suppose, and 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 I think it's important to concentrate on on potential and positivity yes. and so on. So I'm really interested in this current phase, um, uh, you know, of of the, of the gifts that that the pandemic can can give us. Yes, and I think that's sort of weird, isn't it, for people? Again, we're back to the weird. Um, that you know that that is actually something we've got to look at because, as you say, there's always a silver lining in, in something. Well, well, I think I I really understood it when there was you know in the early days the like well they they still are there's a lot of talk about the negative mental health impacts of the pandemic, and I was talking about it i do a, a weekly show on youtube and facebook live called tea with a druid yes and it's yeah, just 20 yeah. minutes i just yeah. chat for 10 minutes and then do a meditation for 10 minutes and um on one of these i was talking about the pandemic and, and two people happened to mention that they'd come off their antidepressants during lockdown and i thought that's really interesting um simply because there was less pressure less pressure on them to 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 stay on the hamster wheel and so on and i googled around and i tried to find people talking about the positive mental health effects of lockdown and there's very little there i i managed to find some article about a decrease of suicide in japan um and that was about it um I'd now this is interesting because i think obviously there's there are obviously certain sectors of of let's say the economy for a better word. So, mm. that are seriously damaged by what's going on obviously musicians yeah just you know however um there are, going back to the thing about medication um i had a sort of a bizarre because you know i'm quite slight built and all the rest of it mm. but um uh two years ago i had a heart attack and a, and a stroke completely out of blue uh, right. just you know so i was sort of whisked off to <clears throat> to um to Brighton Hospital and put a stent in. Yeah. Um, and then two, while I was in hospital, I had a stroke. There's obviously right. something to do with the blood clot or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, which totally, you know, I thought, well, it's weird. And I've always been one who sort of, you know, sort of looked after myself and tried to, you know, I, I, I would sort of revert to using herbs if I could and all the rest and, of it. And, and could I ask, what, at what age were you when you had that? Uh, 59. 
59. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting because actually a few friends of mine had similar things happen at that point in time. Mm. Um, and, um, but what, what happened to me was that, okay, you know, I had the, the medication handed out type of thing, you know, and, and obviously, you know, modern medicine is great for when you get the, you know, the car crash and all the rest of it. And, you, you know, it's like you, you, you're already dialed up to 10, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, during all of this stuff, of course, nobody wants to know you. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you so, mean? You mean? friends well, or because you know you were before before all the lockdown you were getting this text here and text there about you know, come in and do that have this done and come in and do, just check your heart you oh know. you mean the health service that they yeah, yeah 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 but of course when with this lockdown nobody wanted to know yeah you know all that stopped so interestingly um even getting at one point even actually getting medication was slightly tricky yeah. so my blood pressure has dropped down to something really, you know, quite, you're looking at it and think, well, oh, actually, this is pretty good going, I'm, I'm, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and now, just on herbs. Great. Medication. And I'm just wondering how many people have got to that point of thinking, you know, I can't be bothered to go mm. and have to go and make the appointment with the doctor that might literally just be on the phone after I've gone through all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and actually fixed it myself um so i don't i don't know well it's interesting because they talk about the stats of of the people who who get ill or who die because they don't go to hospital you know uh, uh because they're frightened of getting covid uh just as they talk about the negative mental health impacts and of course you know one's not denying any of that that's obviously real yes but but what you're pointing to is a similar thing it's like what about the positive side are there people who are actually benefiting from because there's this whole do you know the term iatrogenic no i if you if you hear doctors mumbling between each other you know i think this patient has died from iatrogenic causes iatrogenic means caused by the doctor um, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, because that is a big killer. Yes, yeah, I know. Yes, yes, that's right. Iatrogenic deaths, it, it's huge. The stats are absolutely extraordinary. I mean, Massive. it's like there are two two areas of knowledge that I don't want to go near. One is I don't want to know about pilots, the level of alcoholism in pilots. Exactly. Please don't tell me. I just want to trust the guy when I'm sitting in a plane yeah. or, or the lady. Um, and likewise, I don't want to look at the stats of it because I started to look and it's extraordinary the amount. Well, of I remember many years ago going to a talk by what's his name? Um, I can't remember. This guy was a was a medical journalist um, and he was sort of advocating that, you know, there are cures for cancer that are not standard mm. things, you know, because obviously within um there are societies that eat certain types of things that and they have low rates yeah. of blah, blah, blah. right um and um one of the things he came out with was the the big killers in the us you know um and one of them of course was medically prescribed drugs correctly uh, prescribed drugs that actually ended up killing the patient yeah which is sort of really where we are on this. And it, it was one of the big killers. This wasn't, you know, it, this, it was, says, it, this it wasn't quite... the incorrectly prescribed medication. This was the correctly prescribed medication. Yes, it wasn't the opioid crisis he was, he was talking about, but actually, yeah, just correctly prescribed. Absolutely. Iatrogenically caused death. Yeah. 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 So um, that's a hot potato will pass away <laughs> but yeah no I, I, and, and of course the thing is good news is not actually reported is it let's face it mm, yeah so when somebody has you know it's almost like no well, we can't go there because actually if you say that that might be problematic because well there's a, i have a friend who years ago started a project called positive news which is a, a magazine um but it makes very dull reading because it's yeah <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it's all wonderful news. Everything. Yes. <laughs> There's some it doesn't strange. Sell anything, does it? Doesn't sell. You know. No. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't. No. And and that's sort of weird that we yes. have to go down that human route. nature in some ways. Yeah, it is absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So so what are your plans 
What are your plans at the moment? What, what, what are you masterminding now? Well, what I'm masterminding is so I've 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 gone through this transition stage. So just coming out of it, really, of having handed over. What we did is we announced it. it you know, I, I really looked at the way organizations, when they change leadership, how they can, you know, often what happens is, you know, the person dies and then it's a mess, you know, and scrambles for power and all that. Yeah. Um, so, so we announced it. We gave a two year, we announced in two years time, we're going to hand over. Uh, and, and then for two years, I worked with Ema so that it was a lovely, smooth transition. And then in June, we had the big ceremony that we put up online and, um, She's now in charge of the order and um, I'm, I've taken a back seat. And what I what I'm doing is I'm focusing just for 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 the next year. I'm focusing on a particular system, which is called sophrology, which is a system developed by a French um, a Spanish. Um, well, originally from Bolivia, but uh, um, neuropsychiatrist about 50 years ago which is huge in France. It's, it's almost impossible to understand how big it is. It's like it's in, you know, there are thousands of sophrologists and um, it's, it was, uh, it's integrated into the healthcare system and so on. And, but it's never crossed the language barrier, really. Uh, but I trained in it uh, six or seven years ago and found it extremely helpful. And it's a form of um, training, sort of mind-body training that, that yeah. where it really gets you into your body. And it's a kind of almost like I call it sort of enriched mindfulness or enhanced mindfulness. And um, so I've started a training program in that. So I'm doing that. It works really well teaching people online. So yeah. I'm making online courses and taking students through that. So every morning I, you know, switch on the computer with a, my coffee and just um, talk with the students who are doing that program. And there are kind of four levels to it. So I'm working on that. And then my plan is to move on in the spring, summer to a book that I've wanted to write for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I've been gradually working on about the religion of Jainism, which. Oh, is right. OK. Very ancient religion. Yes. Uh, yes. But it is extraordinarily interesting, I find. Yes. yes. Um, obviously, I mean, I, 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 I've. We sort of listen to Satish, and uh, I mean, fascinating. Um, it, it, fascinating. It's, it's fascinating, and it hasn't received the same attention that Buddhism or Hinduism has no. has received. And some people mistakenly clump it into Hinduism and yes. think it's a part of Hinduism, but it's not. It's a very much its own uh, person. And uh, and and I've, I've I've been doing it for about ten years, and so. So that's that's my plan for the for the spring. Oh, that's, summer. Interesting. that's interesting. Well, that, that's 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 great. Well, that's a that's a project, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well, um, th that was a fabulous talk, actually, Phil. It's really lovely to speak to you. And um, you know, I, I I think there's a lot of things for people to sort of look at there and, and sort of ponder because you're it, there's lots of areas that you haven't sort of covered. I know because you're yeah, yes, creative. Lots of and um, and I think that's something I, I really like when you get creative people that, you know, there's lots of things that you've done um, that, you know, I think maybe there's something in the way that you do, you know, you, you, you set your mind on something or you allow something to, to manifest. Well, 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 I tell you one of the, the, the what, what, you know, the sort of themes that I've realized is it's important or sort of dynamics, I suppose, it, it's mm. been really important for me to grasp is... Mm that I've often felt or been dogged by the feeling that I'm a, uh, what's it, jack of all trades and master of none, you know. And, and, and my wife, Stephanie, is really good at pointing out the next sentence that comes after that, that nobody quotes, which is better by far than master of one. Yes. And, and uh, so when, when I beat myself up, I tell myself that I'm, I've been dabbling yeah. in all these different things and you know why didn't i specialize in just focusing on depression or you know schizophrenia or you know or whatever it is one particular issue or meditation or mindfulness or sophrology or whatever it is uh but what i see is what i've been doing is is actually 
And that's where we get back to the beginning of our conversation about the 11 year old. It's actually been all everything I've done has been around those two subjects of psychology and spirituality and the, and the, the overlap between the two. And and it's involved traveling around to all sorts of different places. Um, you know, there's a whole world of sort of naturism that I've studied and I've written a book called A Brief History of Nakedness about it and, and so on. But it's all tied, that's tied in with Jainism because the monks are naked and so on. Um, you know, it, it all ties together. And But it just, it, you just have to be, I think if that's in your nature, you have to be prepared for the long haul and to sometimes feel like you're lost. Yes. Oh, and my it, goodness. And... That is so <laughs> brilliant. That because you, you saying that. I think that is the thing about being a musician. Yeah. That you have to be lost. You, you have, have to part, be lost. It's part of the creative uh, process, isn't it? Totally. And also you have to feel like you're some sort of charlatan, you know. Yes. Because what happens, and I think it goes with the territory of just being being creative. It, 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 you, you can't know it all. You can't, you can't know, it. know it all, and you will have times of the imposter, you know, the imposter syndrome. Yes, that's what I mean. You think the charlatan, you know, yes. I'm just an imposter. You're a I don't know what charlatan. I'm... Totally, totally. And, um, but, you know, I, I speak... It's good thinking of the mu musician. I don't know if you know Martin Glover, youth, the record producer. You know, he's in that punk rock band. And, and, and we were talking about creativity, and he explained how he, he got into the music business where he saw an ad when he was young, I don't know, 16, 18, something like that, for a guitar, and he didn't know how to play the guitar. Right. And he just learned a few sort of chords yeah. and pretend, went to the audition and pretended, and he yeah. got in. And, of course, yes. you know, and, you know, and he was hugely successful as a result. I, I, I interviewed Billy Childish a little while ago, who's yeah. the artist, and, and, and I know Bill from playing at the Medway area and stuff like that. And Bill's got like 150 albums, right? Yeah. Because he's it, it, just, you know, he's so prolific on art and poetry and all the rest of it. And um, I said, so how do you get started? And he said, well, I couldn't play guitar. He said, I saw the Beatles. And he said, no, I thought that's what I want to do. <laughs> yes. and I can't sing for Toffees. And he said, I bumped into somebody and he said, do you want to join a band? He said, yeah. <laughs> so he said, then I learned two chords. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's how it started. And you go yeah. like, because that was the sort of punk ethos anyway. It didn't matter if you could play or not. Just join the band. Just get started. I think it's a great message to get out to young people because there's such a stress now on training. You've got to get a degree oh, in hairdressing and you've got to get a degree in this. And a degree, you know, and, and, and it's really hard for young people now because, because of the internet, you know, which is wonderful in one way. Yeah. But it's terrible in another way because the marketplace is so crowded. But you've just got to do it. You've just got to get out there. Totally. Make Absolutely. mistakes and, you know. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that was brilliant. Thank well, you. Thank you, Vic. Well, thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed yeah, talking. It's great. Yeah, it's great. It was, it's, it's a real pleasure to have you on, on board. It's really good. And, yeah, best of luck with everything. Thank you so much. Best of luck for, for you, too. Thank you very much. Well, I really enjoyed that. Uh, you could probably tell from the, the interview. Um, and again, some of the, the sort of points that came up in that for me um, was how even as early as the age of 11, uh, there were lots of elements of his life were already sort of in place or in play. And I think that's quite, that's a, quite a common thing when we look back. So, uh, yeah, so thanks to Philip for his time. And um, obviously you can get all the details um, of how to contact him uh, on the show notes. And if you'd like to help me out, you could always visit my Patreon. There's lots of um, extra things for the uh, people who give me a little bit of money. Um, guitar uh, courses and stuff like that that are on, on the site. So uh, until next time, I shall see you then.